Hi, everybody. Thank you so much for joining us. Um, it's wonderful to be here with you and with our fabulous authors, Amy Schiller and Tim Schwab. I'm Bella Devon, an editor of the website inequality.org and the associate director of the Charity Reform Initiative. We live within the Institute for Policy Studies, which is a multi-issue progressive think tank fighting inequality, corporate power, polluters, and militarism since 1963. Our charity reform initiative works to turn ideas into action to transform philanthropy so that it genuinely benefits our common good. We publish original research and are organizing with all different kinds of stakeholders in our quest to unearth philanthropy's problems, overhaul outdated laws, boost the flow of funds to work in charities, and protect our democratic institutions to ultimately construct a more equitable country. I don't think it's an understatement to say that wealth inequality defines American life and by consequence defines American giving. The majority of people in the world are poorer now than they were before the pandemic, while US billionaires have gotten by our count 88% wealthier. And many American workers, including firefighters, teachers, nurses, pay a more burdensome tax rate than these billionaires yet take home less income in a year than average CEOs of large companies make in a few hours. In other words, fewer citizens hold more wealth, pay less in taxes, and give more money away according to their discrete priorities than should be remotely plausible. Plutocratic wealth sucks for so many reasons. Costs skyrocket, healthcare gets worse, newspapers fold, airplane walls fall off, our infrastructure crumbles while corporate profits soar. And when it comes to philanthropy, the desires of ultra-wealthy donors crowd out the will of everyday people who are as generous as they can be. Philanthropy, voluntary benevolence, expresses how givers want the world to look. And as our authors thoroughly explain, many of our wealthiest philanthropists express a pretty narrow and dehumanizing definition of what is valuable in that world. When people give money away how they make it in this economy, it should concern all of us. Our current system provides opportunities for donors to concentrate their influence, launder their reputations, preserve wealth, and forgo solving the root causes of inequality, which necessitate philanthropy in the first place. And philanthropy is a creature of the tax code, the same tax code that cushions our richest and disproportionately burdens our poorest because of what some call the bargain and the expectation that it'll benefit our common good. A low dollar giver is likely to give their donation directly to a working charity or nonprofit. But let's game out how a typical ultra wealthy giver might approach their philanthropy. Statistically, this kind of philanthropist is quite likely to contribute to their own private foundation or donor advised fund intermediaries which can funnel money or assets to the causes of their choice. Think the Gates Foundation, which we'll discuss lots, or perhaps Leonard Leo's shadowy court influencing network, which relies on shell games and anonymizing loopholes to realize its minoritarian agenda. Ultra wealthy givers, it's worth noting, also favor private hospitals and universities and putting their names on them. <laughs> and these gifts, which dramatically reshape society and our common sense along with it, are tax deductible and subsidized by the public by up to an estimated 74 cents per dollar. While the news is full of stories of rich donors giving huge sums to charity, which they absolutely do, we're always concerned with that missing piece. A lot of donated wealth that garners tax reductions up front, pledged to foundations or to be given away over the course of a lifetime, doesn't end up going anywhere or at least anywhere quickly enough. And that's why we currently have a massive pool of assets worth well over a trillion dollars piled up in charitable intermediaries like foundations and donor advised funds, already subsidized by the public, yet subject to insufficient disbursement requirements and lagging in reaching working charities. It's also why the billionaires who signed the Giving Pledge in 2010, promising to give away the majority of their wealth in their lifetimes, aging if they wished they could live forever, have seen their collective wealth grow by hundreds of billions. And that's a pretty infuriating abdication of responsibility. So all these system failures bring us to this conversation today. Philanthropy is facing daunting trust and legitimacy crises, but things don't have to be this way. Excitingly recent polling that our team commissioned with the Giving Review shows major support across the political spectrum for meaningful reforms to transparency, disbursement rates, and taxpayer subsidization of charitable intermediaries. And Tim Schwab's The Bill Gates Problem and Amy Schiller's The Price of Humanity should be understood as standard bearers in this ongoing talk. They view philanthropy and inequality as co-constitutive political problems that demand political solutions because they believe that a better world is possible. So without further ado, a little bit about our authors. Tim Schwab is an investigative journalist based in Washington, DC. 
His reporting on the Gates Foundation has been published in The Nation, the Columbia Journalism Review, and the British Medical Journal. His book, The Bill Gates Problem, Reckoning with the Myth of the Good Billionaire, received an Editor's Choice designation from The New York Times, and The Telegraph called it an extraordinary and detailed work of investigative journalism into an underexplored nexus of influence in global affairs. The book's being translated and sold in a dozen different territories from India to Germany to South Africa and Spain, and it's been reviewed by dozens of news outlets around the world. And Amy Schiller is a writer and political philosopher who's currently a visiting scholar at Dartmouth College. She's held additional fellowships at Stanford University, Bard College, and City University of New York, where she received her PhD. Her writing, philanthropy-focused and cultural criticism, has been published in The Washington Post, The Atlantic, The Nation, and The Daily Beast. She's also had a 15-year career in major gift fundraising consulting, which I'm certain that we'll hear about. I'm really delighted to be speaking to these authors today, and we'll have time for a Q&A, so you can think up some good questions for our panelists, which you can enter into our chat box. Um, so Amy, I would love to start with you. Um, what is the price of humanity and how did you recognize troubling shifts in giving culture through your major gift philanthropy work? Um, thanks for that question. Thanks for having me. Um, the price of humanity came about as I realized that um, philanthropists in ways that I'll describe in detail uh, were approaching their giving in the same manner as you described that they do a lot of other transactions in their acquiring of money and the management of money. And that would mean sort of labeling uh, human beings as kind of pricing their value, pricing the value of their longevity, the value of their productivity, um, looking at things with that very reductive um, and calculated view. Um, and to me, that was a very sort of troubling evolution in the mentality and the vocabulary and the norms of how and why people give. Um, especially for an activity that literally means love of humanity. Um, that's philanthropy's literal meaning. And I thought love of humanity is not really expressed by assigning these kinds of quantifiable metrics um, of sort of assigning and calculating the value of philanthropic dollars um, and the value of what they produce. So how did I come to understand this? It, it, was, it was in fact in my career early on in the conversations I had with multiple donors, particularly at the major gift level, who um, sort of shifted away from talking about giving as an expression of commitment of values, connection to community, biography, history, other ways of being in the world and sort of seeing things as worthy and valuable and really shifting towards um, a kind of relentless expectation of quantifiable returns on investment. Um, quantifiable metrics that showed the outputs of their giving in terms that would be recognizable to them as investors um, and as sort of capitalists. Um, so as I saw that language changing, that's what uh, inspired me to study this phenomenon as a philosopher, really thinking about how the ways we think about giving and practice giving shape us as citizens um, and allow us to see others and see their value to us. Um, and to build a world that really affirms that value. So I wanted to both criticize the ways that we are moving away from that and find examples of how we could sort of return to that ideal, return to a, a philanthropy that truly shows a love of humanity as full human beings. Thank you. And Tim, would love to hear what the Bill Gates problem is to you and how it connects to your credo as a journalist. Um, sure. So I am an investigative journalist. And if you study journalism in the United States, you learn this old bromide that your job is to afflict the comforted and comfort the afflicted. So if that is your mission as a journalist to afflict the comforted, then Bill Gates, one of the richest people in the world, and the Gates Foundation, one of the wealthiest and most powerful, probably the wealthiest and most powerful philanthropy in the world, should be um, among the most scrutinized people and institutions in the world. Um, but three, four years ago, when I started my reporting on the Gates Foundation, you could look across the media landscape and see that that wasn't the case. Um, journalists cover the Gates Foundation a lot, um, but they tend to report on the Gates Foundation in a way that is uncritical or even favorable. Um, and this has been a widely observed. Um, Seattle Times has reported this. Columbia Journalism Review has reported this. Fox has reported this. 
So I'm not the first person to notice, and maybe many people on this call have also read news coverage of the Gates Foundation focused on its big ambitions and its big donations. Less common, though, um, though still occasionally newsrooms do report on the Gates Foundation for what it is, which is an unregulated political organization. Um, it is uh, Bill Gates going around the world, meeting with elected leaders, shaping government priorities and government spending. He's intervening in public health and public education. So these are public policies that in free and open democracies, we would want to be organized in a public manner. Um, and what the Gates Foundation is doing is not donating money, but it's buying influence. It's buying a seat at the democratic decision-making table um, in a way that is really, I think, better defined as money in politics than it is the common definition of charity or philanthropy. So I do think that um, you know what the Gates Foundation presents is a stunning and to some extent new expression of billionaire power. Um, I wrote this book about Bill Gates and the Gates Foundation, but in many ways it's a case study for this bigger problem of extreme wealth and extreme inequality. Um, when you allow, when we allow a very small group of people to become so obscenely wealthy as Bill Gates is, we know these people will use their wealth for political ends, if not campaign contributions, if not lobbying, then as Bill Gates shows us through philanthropy. So if we don't discuss and debate and interrogate our Bill Gates problem today, we are going to have a very big Mark Zuckerberg and Jeff Bezos problem going forward. Um, Gates is, you know, very aggressively campaigning, uh, asking other billionaires to follow in his footsteps and hundreds have agreed, um, who have said that they plan to give away most of their wealth, you know, and this means there could be hundreds of billions or maybe trillions of dollars coming down the pike in philanthropy. And what I'm arguing in this book is that that's not cause for celebration, but that's cause for concern, because what that portends is a political future in which, um, you know, tech billionaires wearing the superhero cape of philanthropy play an increasingly um, influential role in public life in, in figuring out how we fight climate change, how we regulate artificial intelligence, how we organize public health, public education, all of these areas that are so vital to um, a functioning democracy. Um, so that's why I wrote The Bill Gates Problem. Yeah, it's stunning to think about the Gates Foundation as a real harbinger of what's to come. And Amy, you write in your book that the foundation has used both its means and its clout to influence philanthropy writ large. So not just to provide an example to the philanthropists, but to also shape norms of the sector. Um, I'd love to hear more about that from both of you, just about practices, about how the philanthropy is operating. So the example I use in talking about Gates is uh, when he's starting out, um, he has a conversation with Nick Kristoff um, based on an article that Kristoff wrote um, about uh, intestinal disease um, killing children in Africa. And he says, uh, I, I got into this because of your column, but not just because of the column. It was really just the stats. It was just the stats that were included alongside uh, the actual storytelling that was happening. And later on in a documentary about him, um, he goes on to say, we are not working retail, we're working wholesale. We're trying to work at a scale um, that really doesn't allow for a full understanding of the complexities of the human beings and the society's situations necessarily that we are intervening in. We're trying to find something that is um, scalable at such a, a vast scope. Um, so there's this dismissal, at, even at the earliest moments of um, complexity, and of the full humanity of the people who he is allegedly helping and his foundation is allegedly helping. There's a dismissal of that as an obstacle to making the kind of impact that he wants to make. Um, and you can see how that's influenced other givers. Um, first of all, in the giving pledge um, and in the uh, spread of that as a sort of tactic to involve others in giving, which he spearheaded. You can also see it in the sort of standard that it has set for being much more kind of rigorous in the management of giving as, in, as if it were an investment portfolio and the tracking of returns, the tracking of uh, the ROI 
per dollar, philanthropic dollar, and this encouragement to really narrow the focus in this very utilitarian way to this sort of maximum number of, a uh, minimum amount of good for the maximum number of people. Um, and the thing I will say about it that sort of sums it up is that their motto is um, every life has equal value, which implies that they have determined that value. Um, that there is, it's not that every life has value, but that there is an equal value that is sort of known and understood as a consensus and can be kind of understood and calculated. So the influence really is in shifting philanthropy in this utilitarian direction because he is so influential. Um, many people have followed in his footsteps and sort of allowed that approach, um, that very reductive approach to filter into multiple levels of giving um, that is a long tail behind him in how the philanthropists coming up like Mark Zuckerberg, like Elon Musk, um, have started to think about how they might approach their giving. So you see it not just in the kinds of things that they're giving to, but in what they might try to accomplish and what constitutes success. Um, yes, to, to, to piggyback on that, um, you know, Amy earlier defined philanthropy as a lover of humanity. And it's something I look at in the book too and see, does Bill Gates and the Gates Foundation really fit under that original meaning of the word philanthropy? Or does he fit better under the word misanthrope, which is, if not hatred of your fellow human, it's it's a belief that you are superior to them, that you have more talent and skills. Um, and a way you can see this, for example, is in the Gates Foundation's, you know, more than a decade and billions of dollars of spending in agricultural development. Um, you know, Bill Gates had a big idea to revolutionize agriculture. He said he would double yields, he would cut hunger in half, he would dramatically incre increase farmer incomes. And he would do this through his own idea about industrialization, about bringing in agrochemicals and new high-tech solutions and high-tech seeds, irrespective of the wishes of his intended beneficiaries, farmers in these African nations where he was working. Um, so he really had very little regard for their wishes or their needs or their own ideas, their own solutions. And Gates's Green Revolution has failed. You have independent research showing that it did not do what he, he set out to do, to double yields and cut hunger in half. And in some important regards, we're actually going backwards in some of those metrics. But more importantly, you have farmer organizations today across the African continent who are openly petitioning the Gates Foundation, asking it to stop its charitable crusade because it's causing so much harm. So is there a more damning indictment of a charity than your own intended beneficiaries asking you to stop helping? And what does it say about Bill Gates and the Gates Foundation that in the face of this, of this criticism, of this, of the, the people you're intending to help, just asking for engagement, asking to, to be stakeholders, to be part of the conversation, that you can willfully ignore their wishes and desire and double down on your existing agenda. How does that behavior fit within this idea of humanitarianism or philanthropy? I mean, so to your question, Bella, I think what Gates has done to some extent is just normalize and legitimize this, this kind of philanthropic behavior that's, I think it's fairly called very colonial. It's this idea that, you know, Bill Gates, by dint of his great wealth, um, and that qualification alone, that he is entitled to go out in the world to remake uh, the lives of other people, to solve other people's problems. Never mind that he has no experience or training in agriculture or farming. Never mind that his solutions aren't working. Never mind that the people he's claiming to help are asking him to stop helping. Um, so there's a real kind of entitlement and hubris um, that... Yeah, and you know, part of this again, I do think gets back to the media narrative, which, in its failure to really scrutinize and understand Gates in these terms, has really normalized and legitimized this in a way that I do think probably echoes throughout the larger practice of philanthropy about what is acceptable, what is normal. I mean, I think you know, as we'll probably talk, that conversation within philanthropy is rich, it's robust. There's different perspectives. Amy and Bella have you know their own critical points of view, as do I. Um, but I do think there probably is something there. Absolutely. Yeah, your your interventions, I feel like, are are very, very clear and very strong and have a lot to do with the the ways that coverage has fallen short of the methods. Um, I'd love to know more about like your priorities in terms of solutions and how you'd say that your interventions, the interventions your book makes, your books make in these problems relate to the portfolio of solutions that you're seeing out in the world. And are those solutions gaining traction? Do you feel like your books are participating in that shift? 
Uh, sure, I'll start. Um, yeah, I so like Bill Gates, I am an impatient optimist. I look out and I see, you know, decades now of really inspiring political and social movements that show me that the world is changing, that the world is turning against the kind of plutocratic ethos that Bill Gates brings to the table as a philanthropist. If you look at Occupy Wall Street, if you look at Black Lives Matter, the Green New Deal, decolonize global wealth, um, you know, these are strong and growing political and social movements that if you think about them as they relate to Gates, they really present an existential threat to his model of business, to the richest guy gets the loudest voice sort of protocol that defines the Gates Foundation and what it's doing. Um, you know, even on the political right, you see growing uh, distrust or dislike of Bill Gates and the Gates Foundation. You know, and a lot of that, I think, is coming down to this idea that the, just the specter of oligarchy that he presents, that this really rich guy can intervene in, in such a substantial and significant way at home and abroad. You know, we shouldn't lose track of the fact that the Gates Foundation has um, intervened in very significant ways in U.S. public education in ways that have failed to improve education in ways that have made him deeply polarizing and unpopular among teachers and unions and some parents and some students, and in ways that have caused collateral damage and opportunity costs. Um, so, you know, the interventions, you know, are many. There, there are uh, a great many ways to, to reform uh, billionaire philanthropy, to make it more accountable, to make it more transparent. But ultimately, you know, what I'm the conclusion I came to in writing this book is that the problem is, or the solution is less about regulating the Gates Foundation and addressing and regulating the extreme wealth that fuels the Gates Foundation. Um, if you try to put new rules or regulations around the Gates Foundation, there's nothing to stop Bill Gates and Melinda Gates from creating an outside LLC to do the same work in a way that's unregulated by those, those new regulations over a private foundation, for example. And indeed, that's something I found in my reporting is that Bill and Melinda French Gates are spending an increasing amount of time, energy, and money on outside adjacent LLC organizations, Gates Ventures, Pivotal Ventures, Breakthrough Energy Ventures, so on and so forth. Um, so I do think that that's the fundamental intervention we need to think about is is um, is the extreme wealth that fuels Gates' philanthropic career. I should just say really quickly, his wealth has increased very significantly during his tenure as supposedly the world's most generous person on earth. In 2000, the start of his philanthropic career, his estimated net worth was $60 billion. Today, it's $130 billion. You know, what does this say? Again, this idea of philanthropy and charity, how could the world's most generous person becoming become phenomenally wealthier during his tenure as a philanthropist? At a point, we should recognize he's giving away money he doesn't need, he could never possibly spend on himself. And there's nothing generous or sacrificial in this, in this, in this activity. And I'm not sure it really, I, I just don't think that philanthropy or charity is the right way to think about what he's doing. Well, I want to um, take that uh, piece even to a, a, a different metaphor, um, which is uh, I wrote about Mackenzie Scott um, using a similar lens and her desire to give until the safe is empty. Um, and I compared her to uh, Lucy and Ethel at the chocolate factory trying to wrap the chocolates fast enough to like get them out and they can't even wrap the chocolates fast enough. They keep having to stuff them in their mouths. There's a rate at which this wealth gets sort of reproduced that is not solvable with even the most radical rates of giving in history, which is what Mackenzie Scott has set out to do. Um, and so what one lesson from that and where I'd completely agree with Tim is that some of the problems in what to call them problems in philanthropy is too far downstream of where they actually originate. They originate far further upstream and really require political solutions because in order for philanthropy to play the role that I believe it should play, um, it sort of needs to take place under improved conditions. So it is sort of already compromised under conditions of massive inequality. Um, so there's a few levels at which we can think about solutions. Um, and some of these are indeed changing how we govern philanthropy. So things around um, the structure of the tax deduction could be an important way of kind of inverting how we incentivize giving. And I know this is something people 
um, on this call have just have thought about and discussed, you know, do we change the way we have the deduction as more is more versus having it as a cap or a percentage of giving or something that's more inverted to incentivize people at all levels giving um, if it's going to be part of our tax code. So there are ways that we can kind of uh, change the governance of philanthropy to make it more democratic and to encourage participation as opposed to volume of gift, which really lends itself to validating this extreme wealth um, that both Tim and I rightly, you know, criticize. Um, I've spoken about political reforms um, and sort of broadly speaking, um, again, in order for philanthropy to do what it is best suited to do, we need, this is, you know, very broad, but we certainly need a more robust social welfare state um, that addresses um, housing and food security um, and other sort of basic needs as matters of right and policy, rather than leaving them vulnerable and leaving people vulnerable to the point where um, we're really relying on and there's an opportunity for um, oligarchs to sort of come in and own that, sort of own the means of provision of those basic needs. But to get more specific on that, one way I'd like to get at this and sort of bring um, advocacy for philanthropy sort of more closely in relationship with political reform is something I propose called the giving wage. Um, so the idea that we should be going beyond the idea of a living wage, which would pay people enough to sustain themselves, um, and think about a giving wage as a sort of rallying point for um, people who really want philanthropy to succeed um, without sort of compromising uh, too many other institutions in our society. So a giving wage would be give, paying people enough that they have the security to afford to give. This would just be another way of both democratizing giving and sort of aligning philanthropy with the pursuit of economic justice rather than the validation of extreme wealth. So that's one sort of intervention that I see where we can connect it to political, political economy. And then the third level is shifting our paradigm of, uh, and this is a much longer project um, and that both of our books are trying to do of saying, okay, how do we think about what philanthropy's role is supposed to be? I think we're um, encouraged to think about philanthropy that solves crises as good because it's solved a crisis allegedly, um, rather than allowing us to think about how it has maybe created that crisis through prior conditions um, and really think about philanthropy not as a way of meeting basic needs or addressing crises, but about creating conditions um, that allow everyone to flourish and playing this sort of supplemental but crucial role um, in building those spaces and those institutions. So that's not as implementable in a pragmatic sense that we can see examples of it, but there's, you know, that's going from most kind of precise to broadest what I see the scope of solutions including. Yeah, thank you both so much. I think this tension between the individual world building made possible by more plutocratic philanthropy and the collective world building, Amy, that you really gesture towards in your book, this idea that the process of making the world that we all live in should be the domain of philanthropy once everybody's needs are attended to. Um, I'd love to talk more about that. I'd love to talk more about your concept of magnificent philanthropy, what that might mean and look like. And Tim, if you want to weigh in more on ways that you've seen or don't see philanthropy contributing to this collective world building process. I know that you have examples from uh, the Gates story. Well, I'll to define what it is for me. So the concept of magnificence, um, it comes from Aristotle and Aristotle suggests that um, magnificence is a way of sort of making beauty, using money rightly um, to sort of provide things of beauty and um, lavishness and grandeur available to all. So if we use our money in ways that uh, we want to buy something special for a loved one, or we want to buy something beautiful for ourselves, that's, that's individual consumption. Um, but when you follow the sort of virtue of magnificence, it's basically saying nothing's too good for everybody. There's a way of it validating um, everyone's full humanity and their full, their right to sort of live full and flourishing lives. Um, so when I think about magnificence, I think about creating things that are um, beautiful or enriching that are as freely accessible as possible. 
Um, and this might mean physical spaces. Um, it might mean institutions. I write quite a bit about libraries and the, why it's important that uh, many of the libraries, which were uh, their capital expenditures were funded by Andrew Carnegie and then their ongoing operations are funded by a combination of public funding and ongoing private sustaining contributions. Um, it's important that those spaces are beautiful, that they have this sort of, they generate this level of attachment, they generate this level of sort of dignity and community for others that they wouldn't if they were just functional buildings. So it's that margin of difference of saying, how can we make things not just functional, but beautiful and enriching that philanthropy has the flexibility to do. And that adds something very important that is affirming of everyone's full humanity versus just their sort of basic sustenance. Um, an interesting parallel story is that the Gates Foundation, one of its big first charitable projects was donating money to libraries. And, and of course, they were partnering with Microsoft and they were, it wasn't about, um, I don't think it was at all the magnificent philanthropy approach Amy was talking about. It was about introducing technology and specifically computers loaded with Microsoft software into libraries. And at that point, at the turn of the millennium, um, you know, journalists were much more eager to put a critical lens to Gates. And they quoted, the New York Times quoted someone saying, you know, this isn't philanthropy. This is just seeding the market. You're just getting people acclimated to Microsoft software so that they'll become lifelong consumers of the of, of the products you're giving away. Um, so yeah, there is kind of an interesting uh, history of philanthropy's nexus with libraries. Um, I mean, but to your question, Bella, um, you know, I would say that probably everyone on this call has participated in charity as a giver or taker or both. I know I have. And, you know, my reporting on Gates, it started with a grant from the Alicia Patterson Foundation, which does one thing. It gives out grants to journalism for the sake of supporting journalism. It's not this foundation doesn't have its own agenda about which ideas or which politics it supports that it's trying to amplify and elevate by funding those journalism. It's really funding journalism for the sake of funding journalism. It's a very small foundation, but the funding it gives to someone like me four or five years ago, who was a struggling freelancer, was really vital to my career. Um, and you can compare that to the Gates Foundation, which also gives money to journalism, hundreds of millions of dollars, in fact. Um, many, uh, there are few newsrooms, certainly in the United States, that don't have some financial tie to the Gates Foundation. Either they're getting funding from Gates, their journalists have outside employment with Gates-funded organization or doing Gates-funded fellowships or Gates-funded grants. Um, it really is stunning the level of financial influence that the Gates Foundation has over the news media. It's also non-transparent, so we can't see all of it. But the Gates Foundation takes a very different and I would say non-magnificent approach to funding journalism, which is that it's really focused on elevating and amplifying the Gates Foundation's agenda, its priorities, if not also its own reputation and brand and legacy. It's not funding journalism because it believes in the importance of journalism as the fourth estate, um, as a critical watchdog in, in over democracy. It's funding journalism um, to really promote the work that it's doing, or certainly that the agenda it has. Um, so I think that that's a real problem. Um, but, but yeah, I do want to I do want to emphasize though that you know of course there are, you know there are examples of of good philanthropy out there, and I'm the beneficiary of one. This really chimes with our sort of previous mention of Mackenzie Scott and her deep engagement with the trust-based philanthropic approach, this idea that she's tr entrusting her grantees with the money that she gives them, um, even as her giving fails to keep pace with how much wealthier she's getting. I will note that um, in our recent analysis um, at inequality.org, she was the only billionaire in the top 15 billionaires in the US to have decreased her wealth since the beginning of the pandemic, but it was by less than a billion when um, her enterprise or her her outfit has given away more than $17 billion. Um, so just some more perspective on that um, increase. So um, I'd love to know more about how you think that your books, in terms of your methods and putting them together and your messages and how you're disseminating them, relate to this broader discourse and culture shift that we're sort of getting at, this idea that 
people in this country and all around the world are not taking extreme inequality as inevitable. And they're really sort of critically reappraising philanthropy. So how are your books participating in that broader discourse shift? And how do you want to talk? How do you how do you assess how media is doing covering philanthropy? What about your methods should carry over across how the sector gets covered? Um, we'd just love to hear more about that. And Tim, you were just talking about journalism. So let's go right back to you. Yeah. Uh, I mean, some of this work was already done for me, you know, in 2021, I think was the absolute zenith of the Gates found of Bill Gates philanthropic career. He was, you know, on the media, it seemed every night, you know, as a public health expert about the COVID pandemic, he was also behind the scenes and closed door meetings with governments, with pharmaceutical companies organizing the pandemic response. It was really the the refer it was the 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 top level of of Gates influence on the global stage, and also in many ways an ultimate referendum on what he could do as a philanthropist. Um, he promised that his um, COVID response effort would deliver vaccine equity. It instead presided over vaccine apartheid. Um, you know, Bill Gates became one of the most visible apologists and defenders of big pharma's patent rights in the face of a pretty significant global call for waivers over the patents over vaccines, which would have been a humanitarian measure to scale up production of vaccines to make them more widely available. It's one more example where there was a clear alternative on the table that was widely supported, including by the poor nations that the Gates Foundation claimed to be supporting, and that Gates stood in the way to block that, uh, that pathway. Um, so the failures of the Gates Foundation, the pandemic, combined with Bill and Melinda French Gates' divorce, combined with a uh, ongoing uh, set of allegations about um, Bill Gates' workplace behavior towards female subordinates, Gates denies any wrongdoing, alongside an ongoing news cycle. A lot of the top newspapers in this, you know, Wall Street Journal, New York Times are looking and continue to publish stories about Bill Gates' association with Jeffrey Epstein. They seem to think that's a very important story. I think it does bear scrutiny. Um, so I think by the time my book came out, the narrative was already starting to change on Bill Gates and the Gates Foundation. Um, so what my book does is come into a place where uh, the, the the narrative is already changing. It was just the, the trick now, I think, or the important thing to do now is to create even more mainstream venues and forums to where we can let the many, many critics surrounding the Gates Foundation raise up their voice, where we can finally have an, an open and honest and robust conversation about what the Gates Foundation is and what it isn't and what it's actually doing. Um, so, yeah, I mean, and, and beyond that, I do think that, you know, I think I mentioned this earlier, but I do think political culture is generally changing and that a lot of the neoliberal ideas, ideologies, and solutions that fuel Bill Gates's philanthropic career, a lot of these are going out of favor, even if the whole world hasn't recognized this. But you know, this idea of corporate power and market-based solutions, public-private partnerships, uh, the you know, technology is a solution to everything, the the in, the vital importance of intellectual property over human life. You know, a lot of these ideas, these business-minded uh, practices and business-minded ethos that Bill Gates bring to his philanthropy, I think are increasingly falling out of favor in, in, in his own extreme wealth. Now you have, you know, the Democratic primaries. If you're a presidential candidate, you might be asked, should billionaires exist? So yeah, the conversation around wealth and the, the way that he uses his wealth around money and politics, all of this is changing. I think now the point is to, to really... Um, you know, mainstream that conversation and bring it directly to the doorstep of the Gates Foundation. Uh, really quickly, this, the the subtext of my book is reckoning with the myth of the good billionaire, because for so long, even with all this criticism of billionaires, Bill Gates has been this perennial counterpoint, the one that's difficult to challenge, because as we've been told ad nauseum, he's giving away all of his money, he's saving millions of lives. And you know the real story of the Gates Foundation is far, far different from that. And I think it's finally time to to look at what the foundation is actually doing, not just what it says it's doing, not what the research it funds says it's doing, not just what the journalism it funds says it's doing, but actually follow the money, talk to the sources, and look at what it is doing. What do you think, Amy? So um, to me, a, a thing that's important to strive for is that as we um, criticize and sort of push back on the accumulation of extreme wealth, I would it would be a it would be tragic if philanthropy were um, 
associated as only an elite activity, only um, an activity of the wealthy and of extreme wealth. So you could say that what I am trying to accomplish is both create a space to both criticize inequality and in economic injustice, while also reclaiming philanthropy that is properly democratic and is sort of vitally affirming of what makes us human, that has a real role to play, especially as we look to developments like that, like AI that really devalue the human, that really devalue the human element um, in work and production and even in creativity. So really I'm trying to disentangle things that often become conflated and say, you know, philanthropy can really be reclaimed for the, the people, proverbially speaking. So one way that I um, attempted to do this is in the story of the restoration of Notre Dame Cathedral, um, which became this huge controversy because the most public gifts were these 100 million euro, 200 million euro pledges by the wealthiest families of France that really generated this backlash against there being so much wealth that being put at the disposal of this project. And I thought that is an absolutely rightful criticism of political conditions, including the recently implemented Macron tax cuts that had benefited the wealthiest of France. Um, that's an, a rightful criticism of austerity politics that it slashed social services spending, that that was a great expression of a political critique, but that it um, overshadowed or threatened to overshadow the very significant meaning that people found in donating at all levels to the restoration of Notre Dame, this expression that this mattered to them. Notre Dame from its origins has been the people's cathedral. It's in the middle of Paris. It's not it's some estate far away for only the aristocrats to see it is built by and for the people. And so there's something worth reclaiming about this practice, whether it's um, Notre Dame in Paris, whether it's how we, how poor and working class people contributed and raised $100,000 to install the Statue of Liberty um, through Joseph Pulitzer's first crowdfunding campaign. There's ways in which we can see philanthropy as an expression of as you say, about a collective world building, that it is a practice that generates and affirms democracy and generates and affirms our belonging to each other and to society and our worth to one another. So I wanna see that sort of restored alongside the criticism of the wealth that sort of threatens to corrupt and corrode that ethos. Thank you both so much. Um, I'd love to pivot now to some of the questions that our fantastic audience members have been submitting. Um, the first one I wanna ask is, what kind of regulators or regulations could be brought in to monitor Gates and others? So we can talk about reform. Amy, you started to talk about tax deductions. Um, Tim, I know that you're particularly interested in transparency, but what are your thoughts about um, regulators and regulations for monitoring and also to sort of um, curb the the excesses of the practices here? Well, one idea that the Institute for Policy Studies had that was interesting was um, putting a, what is it, a two or 3% excise tax on private foundations to create a, its own watchdog group instead of the current, you know, IRS as the watchdog group, which doesn't have the funding to really uh, take a close look at private philanthropies. It also isn't really organized to do that because the job of the IRS is to bring money into the treasury uh, through taxation, but private foundations don't pay taxes. So they're not gonna spend a lot of time and energy regulating, scrutinizing organizations that don't pay taxes in the first place. So if you had a different kind of watchdog, you know that might be something, um, yeah, there are a great many, um, I guess the you know you mentioned this in your introductory remarks, Bella, is that up to seventy four percent of every dollar that a billionaire gives away that could be um it's basically a public subsidy, or for every dollar that a billionaire donates, they can get a tax break of up to seventy four percent, seventy four cents, and that many tax scholars today say that that's a tax subsidy, um you know that leaves the rest of us the rest of us to fill in the gaps that are left um with that missing tax funding it's a, so it's a clear measure for accountability for public accountability to say you know what are you doing with our money or we should have rules over how you spend our money and you know what i discovered with the gates foundation is 
just following the money, seeing how the Gates Foundation is spending our money is not possible. There are billions of dollars that the Gates Foundation is giving away today in contracts and professional fees, which we don't know the destination of which. We know that the Gates Foundation is using this great, these great sums of money to advance its charitable mission and its agenda, but we don't know where the money is going or exactly how it's being spent. You know, and even even the money that is publicly reported, you get a, a phrase, uh, you know, a passing phrase that says to 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 increase uh, attention to global health or something very kind of vague like that. So it's very difficult to know how these recipients of Gates funding are actually um, using the money. Um, you know, real quickly, and this is kind of a complicated anecdote, but I do want to make it. You know, in the first chapter of the book. Um, a lot of other writers and scholars have talked about this this weird phenomenon within the Gates Foundation where it's donating money to private companies. So if you the Gates Foundation has given more than $140 million to Pfizer, major multinational for-profit company that does not need charitable contributions. So it's a great deal for Pfizer to get $140 million to get the halo effect of associating its brand with the, the, the world's most celebrated humanitarian. But what do taxpayers get out of that? Is anyone asking that question? What do the global poor get out of that? Are they getting all kinds of benefits in terms of you know free pharmaceuticals out of this relationship? You know These are questions that just are not being asked. Um, you know, yeah, it's it's complicated. Very, I'll try and do this as quickly as possible. But it, the one thing I did in my reporting is take that um, that line of inquiry a little bit further, and I started reaching out to private companies that have worked with the Gates Foundation. Many of these are small startup companies, and a lot of them say that working with the Gates Foundation is like a corporate takeover. That you know, the Gates one uh, pharma company told me that you know the Gates Foundation was telling them who they could and couldn't hire in their own company. Another one was saying that the Gates Foundation is deciding the clinical endpoints of their trials that determine the trajectory of all their development activities. Just an incredible amount of, um, of influence and micromanaging over not just one private companies, but many different competing private companies that might be working on the same vaccine or the same diagnostic or the same drug. And as surprising as it may sound, some of these companies said that the Gates found they accused the Gates Foundation of abusing its power and acting in the exact same anti-competitive way that Microsoft was accused of 25 years ago under Gates's leadership. You know, in what one um, pharmaceutical company told me, quoting Maya Angelou, is that when someone shows you who they are, believe them the first time. You know, Bill Gates remains today the same cold-hearted bullying monopolist that he was at Microsoft. He is not a new and changed man. He has not gone from cold-hearted capitalist to kind-hearted philanthropist. So, you know, just within the idea of regulation, you know, not for nothing, but there are private for-profit pharmaceutical companies out there who think that the Gates Foundation should be investigated for its anti-competitive behavior in pharmaceutical development. Um, so it's something just to put on the table as, as complicated as that anecdote is. I explain with great detail in the first chapter of my book, if you're interested in more. It's true. Tim has a chapter for everything um, in that book. Amy, what are your thoughts on regulation and sort of new new laws that need to be updated? Uh, I'm just going to very quickly, um, I, I do encourage um, a universal tax credit over um, the tax deduction structure that we have. Um, and that sort of goes back to that sense of, can we incentivize smaller dollar participation as opposed to larger dollar participation and find a way kind of redefining purpose of philanthropy through that. Um, DAFs, of course, are a big, donor advised funds are a big topic of conversation and I am in favor of reforms that include a payout schedule for them um, as well as regulations on um, the deductibility at various points of um, both like when, for example, when stock is deposited into um, a donor advised fund and then when it is given out to kind of modify the ways in which those assets um, are removed from tax liability. Um, so those are sort of small interventions to just make sure that um, the, the the tax sheltering function um, and the sort of wealth affirm the the wealth validating function of philanthropy is lessened. That's great. Yeah, we were also asked a question about the DAF boom and if we had positions on 
payout. Um, I would note that the Charity Reform Initiative at IPS has a campaign rolling out next week um, called the Donor Revolt for Charity Reform with an attendant option for um, anybody who's interested in reforming some of these excesses as we've discussed. Um, and we support kind of a bold reform to, you know, create a DAF payout mechanism and also to ensure that money moves through those funds in a timely, in a timely fashion. Um, so thank you both for answering those questions. I have another one from an anonymous attendee. Can you share any examples of democracy-centered and inclusive philanthropic initiatives? Um, so I'm gonna tell what I consider to be the, um, the best story maybe in the book, which is um, the story of LeBron James's school in Akron, the I Promise School. So first thing I wanna say about it is that it's really critical and in some ways radical that um, this foundation is funding not a charter school, not a sort of privately governed institution, but a public school that is within the Akron public school system and has a collective bargaining agreement. So I think as a baseline, we should say democracy-centered philanthropy should necessarily be working in collaboration with and in almost deference to the governance of democratic institutions. It should serve a supplemental function as opposed to this kind of um, takeover function and privatization function that it so often does. So that's just a baseline expectation. Um, and uh, the fact that it, and now of course this is just one school. This is one school, this is not a whole system um, and that school can only accept so many students. So obviously this is more of a model than it is a, a complete solution. Um, the fact that the school and the network of institutions that LeBron funds in Akron now um, have very few regulations around um, sort of eligibility and participation. So his housing center, the I Promise Village, there's no limits on how long families can stay. Um, there's a real, again, that sort of enacts that sense of trust that families who need housing support are not going to, they're not going to take advantage of that unduly. They are there because they need it and they are there because they deserve that support. Um, so this is sort of true across the board. So another requirement for a democratic philanthropy is sort of making things that are sort of freely accessible on the terms of the people who are benefiting from them, free to enter, free to participate. Um, so that that's the second piece. And then third piece is um, the detail that he gives all of the students at the school a bike and a helmet. And he was asked why, he said, when I was a kid, having a bike was what made me feel free. That is so powerful to me partly because you cannot measure somebody feeling free. It is a real trust in them. Um, and it is furthermore a lesson in what are what sorts of people are we trying to encourage and sort of nurture with our philanthropic giving? We're trying to nurture people who can move through the world with freedom, with security, who can participate in life, who are full human beings and can participate in collective life um, rather than just sort of being marginalized um, into dependency. So democracy then also should encourage all of us to become the people who can build the world together. Um, yeah, my focus, you know, as a researcher is less like, I, I come to this as an investigative journalist. I don't have experience working within philanthropy. My goal is less about what philanthropy should look like or how to make it better and more about how to make the economy or democracy better, which means getting rid of this sort of extreme and obscene wealth that um, that fuels the Gates Foundation. So that's more um, that's probably more where where my ideas come to. So I'm not sure I'm the best person to answer this question. Any final remarks from the two of you? Any final thoughts that you want to share with the audience or um, questions to pose to them? I think we'll open up the chat for the last few minutes so people can also chime in there. Thanks so much. Well, I, again, I want to say um, I'm grateful for the opportunity to talk about both what is very much going wrong and sort of rightfully kind of bring our critical eye to what is going wrong and to find ways of thinking through like what can go right um, and to sort of make our way through the muddled middle of sort of these incremental solutions that hopefully move us towards realizing a bigger ideal.
Um, I'll ask a question of Amy. Is that okay? Anything's okay. Well, it's just because earlier, I didn't know if there's going to be any cognitive dissonance in the audience because earlier I was talking about Bill Gates's intervention in public education. I said that there was a, you know, it's a problem. It's bad. Um, it's not working. It's undemocratic and anti-democratic. But your example is of a different billionaire, LeBron James, intervening in public education. And you're saying that's, that's an example of something that's very good. So I think audience, I just wonder if audiences are sort of confused. Yeah. I mean, obviously we're different people. We have different ideas, but I don't know if you could go into that at all. Well, the, well, it's all in the, it's all in the execution and the details um, because you've just described Gates as somebody who does not concede any power and does not share authority. Um, and so if he's intervening in education, the, the approach there is that um He's there to kind of set the set the terms um, of how those institutions are to function, rather than to partner and collaborate and actually supplement work that's being done, and to have any level of deference to um, governing institutions like the public school system. So that to me is just like the key difference is um, you can work with public institutions, but the key is that you're working with them and not trying to sort of take over them and shape them to your own ends. But you're not telling people you're from Ohio, which is the real uh, conflict well, of interest. Well, that's true. Right? I am, <laughs> yeah. Full disclosure. That's right. That's the investigative journalism. Yeah. Um, in, at work, I am. I am from Cleveland. Um, so perhaps, perhaps the uh, that is necessary for this conversation. <laughs> Any final thoughts, Tim, that you want to share with the with the webinar? Um, I don't think so. Um, I mean, I guess just uh, in case I, I, I muddied this earlier, like I think it is, you know, it is true, you know, the tax scholars are saying that if up to 74 cents of every dollar billionaire donates to philanthropy is actually public funds of public subsidy, so we should have some say over it. Or the other option is we eliminate all tax benefits, you know, to billionaire philanthropists. You know, should someone like Bill Gates be given any kind of tax breaks, subsidies, benefits? for engaging in philanthropy? Um, or should he be, in fact, asked to pay far more in taxes? Um, yeah, I mean, the way that the Gates Foundation works is Bill Gates donates money from his private wealth to his private foundation. He collects you know, significant tax benefits in doing so um, in all kinds of public applause, political power, media accolades. But he still, he hasn't really given the money away. He's given it to the Gates Foundation where he continues to control it. And then some of the largest recipients of the Gates Foundation are outside NGOs that the Gates Foundation has created, where the Gates Foundation sits on the board of directors. So the money goes into these organizations and the Gates Foundation still controls how the money is spent. To some extent, they're sitting on the board of directors. So there, there is this issue of, you know, and some of this again gets back to the definition of charity about giving money away. And it, it points that, you know, you look at the Gates Foundation, you try and follow the money and say, well, you're not giving the money away. You're giving the money from your private wealth to your private foundation, to an organization that you run. You've never relinquished control of the money and you've used the money very purposefully to advance your narrow ideas about public health, public education. Right. That idea that that's not an elected power. That's a an individual <laughs> expressing a lot of authority and uh, autonomy in a system that should be run by all of us. Um, thank you everyone so much for attending. Amy and Tim, I can't thank you enough for your time. I recommend that everybody buy their books and learn more about what they have to say. Follow them online. We'd love it if you could keep up with inequality.org and our charity reform initiative. You, the best way to do that is to find us at inequality.org slash subscribe. We send out a weekly newsletter and other dispatches on charity reform. Um, so don't forget about us and um, hope you have a wonderful day. Take great care, everybody. Thanks so much. Thank you so much. Bye. Bye.